okay. I believe I'm I'm awful with names, but I believe Destiny. Yeah. Um, something that you said was that you're not an activist, yet you are doing something. You're being active in bringing a conversation together, making something happen. So you are. I mean, there are different levels of activists, and don't be afraid to lab like label yourself as an activist, but. Like just because you're an activist doesn't mean you're a radical. You know, it doesn't mean you're you're gonna go destroy things or I mean, which always property over lives. But I don't know, like just don't be afraid to speak to who you feel you are. Yeah, I appreciate that. Definitely. I feel like Destiny, you you've always been outspoken, you know. <laughs> I feel like you just like to, you know, voice yourself which which is a good thing. And I feel like shout out to the people in my circle. Uh, Darnell, Nas, uh, my auntie Dana, Stevie, y'all have like held me accountable and like supported me with like this idea as well. So I thank you guys because community is very important. You know, if I got, if I didn't have you guys, I probably would be like, let me just keep posting on Instagram or something, you know, but like I said, I want to take action instead of just, you know, just talking about it. So, and thank you. Tell me, Declan, thank you. Um, no worries. So I guess how we'll start is, how is everyone kind of feeling in this time, right? Um, it's a lot going on. It's a lot to take in. Whether you're Black or not, it's just so much of, like, it's just crazy. So who wants to, like, talk about how they're feeling in this moment? I feel like everything is weird. And, like, the, I definitely see, you know, the Hispanic community a lot more. Oh, shit. Okay, uh, guys, just as a disclaimer, just before we oh. get deep into the conversation, just make sure that we um, mute our phones if we're not speaking because the camera shifts and all that craziness. So just make sure you mute when you guys are speaking. Also, I forgot to pray. <laughs> so, Auntie Freya said. <laughs> okay. okay. Hey, God, uh, Dear Father, God, we thank you for this conversation. We thank you that even though it may seem like a bunch of craziness and bad things happening, it's causing us to be more unified. And so, God, we thank you that even though it may have been rooted out something terrible, you are bringing us together for something amazing. And that unity, you're aligning the world, you're aligning our hearts and helping us to see past color, but exactly how you want us to see each other. And that's just that we're all human. And so we ask that everybody be have the ability to be transparent and comfy on this call that at the end of the day we're family and so god we ask that you help us to be open and honest and true about how we feel um in jesus name we pray amen amen, amen. but yeah back to the conversation i know you're talking Ruben. what were you saying i feel like we're just everybody's getting a lot more united and everybody's wow. fighting for change yeah, that's kind of how I was feeling when I was expressing to my mentor about, in Darnell as well, like when I went to the first protest that they had in LA, mm -hmm. and I was just so happy that it just wasn't like black people. You know, I'm okay with that too, if that's what it has to be, because if we don't fight for us, who's going to fight for us? But to see, you know, other races out there, like fighting for the cause and as passionate yeah. about it as I was, you know, before it was the hype, you know, before like, oh, everyone's doing it, let me hop in the bandwagon. I was like, I was really like happy about that. And that's kind of what made me do this, you know, to see like all the diversity and stuff like that. So I agree with that. What do you think? I know Chris has been out there in the fields. Exactly. Okay. How have you been yeah, feeling this time? I ran, it, I ran it to you guys on Sunday. Um, and for me to like, you know, see people that I know, you know, out on the quote unquote front line, <laughs> um at protests and you know actually seeing the the progress of what these protests are doing um and i don't know if everyone's aware but like we even have countries like germany and italy and um out here protesting justice for george floyd so like this is like a worldwide thing so it's even going beyond um the systematic racism here in America. Um, but for me overall, um, I just, I had a rough week personally on top of George Floyd. 
and the video and everything. Um, so I, I, I was like, I was all over the place. It was a whirlwind for me. Um, things have kind of like calmed down internally, um, but there's still, you know, a lot going on in the world as we can, as we can see. Um, but overall, I think that, you know, and not to make light of what the officer did, but just as he, you know, had his knee on George's neck, I feel like culturally, um, we now have our foot on our justice system neck. You know what I mean? It's like, we, we're really at the point of enough is enough. And uh, I don't see us turning back, like as much as we talked about a new or going back to normal when it came to COVID-19, um, now we recognize this other pandemic of racial injustice um, there's no going back from this as well. So I just look forward to this new kind of reformation and, and change that's on the horizon because I really do feel like we are uniting um, more than ever. How do you feel about it, Nas? You know, uh, I talked to Destiny about it and, you know, Destiny and I have been together for seven years and she's inspired me in so many ways. And last week was really hard, but it also made me check my privilege of like, that was just a week of my life. And so I just, it's really hard for me to grasp the fact that like people aren't loving and fair all the time. And I understand that it's so deep rooted in our history and I'm holding myself accountable. I'm holding my friends accountable. Like we have a group of people that are holding each other accountable because we want to be part of the change also. And we realize like, it's not going to happen overnight. We've had a lot of change actually happen in the last week, but it's not enough. Everything is like deeply systematic and things have to be burned down to the ground and changed. So I want to be a part of that and I'm doing the things that I can do. And if there's anything else I can do, I, I'm 100% in it. That's good. What, a, what about you, Stevie? Stevie D? Stevie! <laughs> um, this has been a very interesting time. Um, Thank you, Sadie. Thank you so very much. Appreciate it, babe. Oh, gosh. Sorry. Go, Stevie. <laughs> I think it's a very um, interesting time for so many different reasons. I think that in the beginning of this, a lot of my friends and family were almost scared to be hopeful because I think that we have heard the, the whispers of police brutality, systemic racism in our communities for so long. And it seemed like nobody cared, but I do feel this resurgence of hope. Um, and like Chris said, seeing globally how people are understanding, this is like anti-blackness is a global issue. It's not an American one. Um, it affects everybody from every culture. You know, we talked about this the other day, uh, Destiny, but like skin lightening products is like a billion dollar industry for a reason. People don't like their blackness and people don't see blackness as worthiness. So I think that having a global perspective about how we can change this is going to be key. Um, and I also believe too that activism has to take on a new face and a new understanding. Um, I do believe that everybody has a lane. And like you said, Chris, some people are in the front lines. Some people are organizers, true at heart. Some people are there to be healers. There's just so many different avenues that we can take to really be activists during this time. And activists shouldn't take on this like occupational connotation. Instead, it should be more about um, our lifestyle. It's a lifestyle change. Just like people take on nutritional health as a lifestyle change activism should just be embedded now in who we are and how we show up for people. That's funny that you said that because we talked yesterday and I told you what they said at the protest and they're like, yeah, we have all these amazing people like Dr. Martin Luther King and um, Malcolm X and stuff like that and people who've actually been on the front line. But the lady was like, they're regular people. Like, I think I, that's really to myself too because that's why I don't call myself an activist because I feel like it's just such a role with so much like that comes with it mm -hmm. and they take it on like okay i'm gonna die for this you know which is amazing but it's like at the end of the day before they were an activist activist 
they were just regular people, you know? So I think that's a test to all of us as like doing our part. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but like doing our part, I feel like having this expectation of like, well, I need to do this and accomplish this and speak like this. It's like, you know, you don't have to do all that, you know? So Mm -hmm. I agree. Franklin? Franklin, right? Or is it Ron, Ron Franklin? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, can y'all hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, I'll just speak to this real quickly. I get to serve as a director of multicultural student development in a college in Northwest Iowa. And um, yeah, I guess the question, if it's uh, why, why it matters uh, for me specifically, right? We think about higher education of uh, developing the future leaders of America, of any space in the world, really. And uh, yeah, if, if we can't recognize that foundational point that uh, if all lives matter, black lives must as well, then uh, we have missed something in our educational process, which means, yeah, society at large is not going to be functioning and flourishing at its fullest potential. So for me, yeah, education is critical to that process. And um, yeah, that's why it's important to me because the future leaders, and especially for us, we're in a Christian college context, like uh, if, if people of faith ain't, are, are not able to grasp <laughs> that the image of God uh, matters and, and we need to make sure that that matters through legislation and conversation and the way we take care of kids, this little dude is wanting to say hi to y'all, um, then yet, yeah, and I think we, we're, missing, we're missing something. We're not going to be able to flourish and, and promote the common good for our people. So that's, that's why it's important for me. Oh. Oh, I was just, I was just gonna keep I was gonna keep going down the line. Hey, Ron, uh, one sec. Can you explain a little bit about how it is? Uh, a little bit about the process, what you're doing right now, as far as the justice issue, and as far as where, what type of city or what type of uh, community, like what, what's going around on there on that side? <laughs> what is what the city like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's it's not Orange County, that's for sure. Uh, it might have some similarities, but yeah, a little different than the West Coast context. So we're in the middle uh, of Northwest Iowa. And so, yeah, kind of literally in the middle of the country, but it's, yeah, the most conservative, most often kind of noted as the most conservative uh, county in, in the country. And so, yeah, very, very heavily Republican, um, very heavily white and agrarian culture. So we got a lot of farmers and um, kind of factory workers and such, but we have uh, experienced a lot of change with immigrants. Uh, coming to our community. So, uh, yeah, of course, the demographics are changing, which means our, our churches are changing a little bit and means our communities are looking different. And uh, just generally speaking, we don't always have the skills to to do life alongside our uh, different brothers and sisters. Um, and so that's, yeah, I think what the emphasis is right now is on trying to find ways to get people to connect e- to each other in ways that they not only hear each other's stories, but that those stories become a part of their own. And I think when that happens, then we can really partner together. So we just hosted Friday, uh, what's called the, or what, what we labeled as uh, the Partnering for Justice Walk. And so, uh, yeah, we had communities from all over Northwest Iowa come together, about 500 people or so, um, which is significant in a town of 6,000 people. Um, and yeah, we, we walked out of the main strip and, um, yeah, had a, had a chance to attempt to partner with our uh, community leaders, our city administrators, our police department, um, our pastors, and our, our college. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of work to be done because some people still feel like this is not an issue that our community needs to deal with. So um, we, we, we got some work to do. Uh, but that's the next steps is partnering with our city and our police department and such, uh, along with our churches and our school. So again any other people want to speak about like kind of how they're feeling in this time um or, you know. i do hey tiffany Hi. hello I how are you um, sorry I'm that you can't wait 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 uh, uh, um but <laughs> i did want to oh sorry wait what happened her tiffany her service problem Okay, until you go then. Can you raise oh, your hand? Hello. In here? Yeah. No, I'm sorry. Yeah. I heard someone yeah. talking. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay, so we're gonna go Tiffany, Dana, Dama. How about that? Okay, perfect. <laughs> Thank you, okay, Dama sorry and about Antoinette. That. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, hello. Sorry. Um, so uh, in, in regards to I've been feeling about this, personally, I've been um, overwhelmed. Um, I think her, Stevie was saying with that, um, I feel like you, when, you, when you really look at what we're fighting for, um, it's not a critique on whiteness. I know the young lady at the beginning of the call said that she was ashamed. Um, and I don't think you should be because it's not a critique on whiteness. We're fighting anti-blackness. And like Stevie said, this is a global issue. There is anti-blackness in the Middle East. There is anti-blackness in Mexico. This is it's a global issue. Um, and so I, I've heard feel overwhelmed and give it's a big one it's a big one and it is going to take a lot of unity a lot of strategizing a lot of planning that we probably have not seen in our decade um and so i've been allowing myself to feel overwhelmed and really getting giving myself the opportunity to get strength from god because i know that i can't do this like the emotions that are coming to me and the things that i'm seeing daily on the internet these aren't things that I feel like I can handle on my own or we can handle on our own. So, um, yeah, frank, frankly, even though I'm seeing, you know, there is hope and I am seeing strides being made, it is like, you can't just look at it from the point of view of the U.S. because this is something, before the U.S. there was England, this is stuff that for, for lifetimes has been going on. Um, so, yeah, that's how I feel. Just wanted to say that. Right. For me, um, I think, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay, so for me, I, I kind of grew up in all white schools for like the beginning of my school career. And probably not until like the end of middle school that everything kind of changed if I moved to LA and Obviously, that was just a whole nother culture. Uh, but for me, I was the Oreo, the white girl on you know on the inside, black girl on the outside. But overall, like those were my biggest issues. It was never for a good portion of my life. I never experienced it firsthand where I was be, being treated differently because I was black, right? And so. I don't think it was until it, like, because definitely will always get mad at me because I'm like, guys, all lives, it's about humanity. It's about, <laughs> we're all the same. We all bleed the same. It's about our community. It's about us. And Mind you, honestly, I said it wasn't. I was saying right now about Black Lives. No, obviously, it's kind of like what everybody says. Like, yeah, all lives matter, but Black lives need to matter, too. And I think it wasn't until recently where it hit me, like, oh, my God, like, we really, not that I've been numb to it, but it's because we have this terrible habit of only being accustomed to or only being affected by what's in our world, like, what's personally happening for us, you know what I mean? And, like, I have cousins from all walks of life. Like, I'm super cultured, but there's never been a moment in Dana, Dana's life where I was, like, lift up and down because I was black or somebody clenched their purse because I was black. But I know that it happens every day. And so there was a almost like this odd or just not just kind of removed from the reality. Like I know it's bad for us, but it's not necessarily bad for me. And so it didn't make me insensitive to the facts of it. It just made me a, mentally a little removed. And I think it wasn't until and then with the habit of Instagram and all that stuff, every other post, you will go through 100,000 different emotions just on one scroll of Instagram. It'll be someone being shot, and the next one, a baby is born, and then the next one, your favorite celebrity is posting a song that just came out. And then the next, and you're going through like 100 different emotions, and so in a sense, you almost become dumb. But I, don't, I think something like pricked me when Ahmad was blatantly and brutally like literally shot to death because I think in the past there's always been this kind of like well it's in the hood he probably shouldn't have been stealing him for that type of thing but when you just see this boy just jogging something struck me and I'm like 
it almost as if like everything that I've been hearing my whole life was awakened out of the back of my mind. Like, yo, we really are out here just, we're just being, we're dying left and right. Like we're literally modern day being lynched. You understand what I'm saying? And then uh, George Floyd, it, I, it just popped me off. And like, Destiny was making fun of me. Like you just became a Black Lives Matter person. Like, you just, <laughs> but it was almost like it, it triggered something in me that may have been lying dormant or may have been, I don't know, like, but I was so consumed in the, in the very first part of it. I got like super sad. Then I got like super angry. And this weird, that thing that's been happening now, and I'm just being super transparent, has, that's been happening lately is I get, I'm like, oh, this is me expressing without really processing completely yet. But I'll be like doing something or in certain neighborhoods, like probably yesterday. And I'm like, well, I'm black. And right now y'all should be doing everything for me because of the matter. Do y'all not know what's going on in the world? I'm black, but you should give me this parking space. Or you should, you know what I mean? Like right now we got the, like, it's our time. Finally, give us something. I'm black, you know? But I think at the end of the day, I think that's kind of been the outcry from us forever. Like, like, what about us? Like, finally give us something because you took us from our homeland to then bring us to this abandoned place, promised us something, never gave it to us. And now we're living in this reality, trying to be 1000%, like a hundred steps forward or ahead where a white person can take one person or one step or an Asian can take one step. Like, and obviously every race has their own thing, but I feel like we've been the bottom of the totem pole and finally it, and like i think the seal of it because we went to arizona for a vacation and i was still a little removed but i remember like one of the nights like our niece my niece sorry came upstairs like what are you doing and i was like locked in the room just looking at all of the different footage of everything just gone like lost and it's super sad and i was just like god like why why did it have to be us why couldn't it why why couldn't it have been any other race? And then it was just like, well, then that's not fair because I wouldn't want to put this on anybody else. And it's just like, well, why does it have to be this way? And it was just like, it's upsetting me now because I'm just like, because I really care about the human race, Why? what is it that is dividing us as a people? Like, we should all be on the same accord. Why does it have to be this injustice? But I say all of that to say, that Wednesday when we came home, I was driving home and didn't even know I was in it, but rolled into a protest. And the car, all of the surrounding cars around me were all white people. And I turned to the right and they're like, Black Lives Matter. And I was just like, oh my God, like, oh my God, this is too much. And I, I turned over and I just was like, thank you. And she was like, I would march until I die. And I said, I just cried. Like, I couldn't help it. I just cried because I felt like, wow, like, we finally matter. Like, we we finally, at, our, at least being considered equal now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Now there's some awareness. You know, for us, and it's, it's like you guys have said, and I'm reading that it's become a world problem now. And so maybe now that it's a world issue, maybe we can all finally get to this place of peace and equality. So I feel like I've been talking a long time. So I'm going back on mute. Bye, guys. <laughs> somebody else next? Hi, everybody. So I'm the God mom. I'm Antoinette. I live in Phoenix, Arizona. I was born in Compton, California, raised in Moreno Valley when Moreno Valley only had one street light. So I have had a multitude of emotions um, the last few weeks. Um, I consider myself a new mom, even though my son is seven, I still consider myself a new mom. And with that being said, a huge part of my emotion is, was I selfish in bringing my son into this world, knowing what he was going to have to deal with, knowing that I have to prepare him for what could happen to him and the things that he's seeing on TV. 
one of the biggest things that has been hard for me and my husband to communicate to my son is all the evil things that are being done and that it's by white people or Caucasian people or whatever politically correct you want to call it, but yet still teaching him that we love everybody regardless. Um, the other emotion I have is for my husband who decided to go out and protest this week. And the minute he left going out, I'm in fear, in fear that he's just going to be protesting peacefully and someone's going to react a certain way. But my very last emotion is anger. And that anger is not for white people or other people, but for my own people. And let me explain that. I am good with the protesting. I am good with us fighting for justice. What I'm not good with is us not having a strategy, a plan, an agenda. What's the end game? That is what angers me, is we're out here, we're protesting, and some of us are doing it peacefully, and some of us are making it worse by having actions that basically feed into the stereotypes of what people think about us already. But my biggest, my biggest anger is that we don't have a strategy, we don't have a plan. And I think it's awesome that we have this worldwide movement and all these cultures that are behind us supporting us, but do they even know what our agenda is? Do they even know what the plan is, what the end game is? Where are we going with this and what, what, like, okay, when the protesting has stopped, and if we're not going to stop protesting, um, you know, what, what, what are we, what is it going to take for us to stop protesting? Does anybody have those answers? And is it going to be pointless? When it's all said and done, are we all going to go back to our little houses and our little homes and our little families and our little communities? And then it just stops there. So that's, that's where I'm at with it. I, I, I'm, I'm angry at our, our culture and our community for not having a strategy, not being supportive of one another, not educating one another. I mean, we, we have educators, we have lawyers, we have judges, we have doctors, we have celebrities, but we're not investing back into our own communities. And then everyone has something to say when it's time to protest, but when the protesting stops, what's next? Where do we go? I'm done. <laughs> Anybody kind of want to answer? Uh, Alicia, how do you feel about it? <laughs> you don't put her on the spot. Yeah, you got to. <laughs> nah, it's fine. Um, honestly, I'm over it. I'm just, um, I don't know. Me, me personally, I'm an empath person, so I can feel people's emotions. So I've, I've been fasting from social media because I'm just tired of seeing all the stuff. Um, I've personally, growing up in Boston, I've always been around black people and like my high school, we were, we weren't the minorities. And then I ended up going to HBCU, but it was after graduating that I experienced racism. And instead of being angry, like it's like embedded in me to how to respond to and react. So to make sure that my life doesn't end that way after feeling the racism. And I don't know, I just, it's about time that it's it's being recognized like a lot of times when people when black people experience racism it's like not exposed but i feel like now that everything's going on it's being exposed and people are realizing it's still happening but i do agree with um antoinette i think that's how you say her name um what happens after i've been through the protest um when sandra bland got killed I was there protesting, protesting, and now I'm just like, I don't want to protest. I want to see changes because I feel like 
I've done the protest, what happens after? It's amazing that it's worldwide and, and it's getting attentions of other countries, but it shouldn't have to, it shouldn't have to have happened that way. It should have been being handled and being fixed. And now that I see, um, when I was on social media, a lot of, I've seen a lot of people like, oh, I'm gonna vote now. I'm like, you should have been voted. Like, I feel like it's the system that we just need to start from there, like to change a lot of these rules that, um, rules and everything that's going on so that it works in everyone's favor. So now that the protest isn't happening and now people want to want to vote, it's like we have to have a plan. We, we need to, okay, this happens. What happens next? What's going to come next? Like, that's what I want to see. And a lot of times I don't speak out too much because I don't, me personally don't feel like I'm educated enough to have enough knowledge to speak out on a lot of things. Like I need to learn it as well. Like, you know, like, you know, when you're in high school, history class, you don't learn that history, black history. You have to learn it within the, the home. And unfortunately in my household, we didn't learn a lot. So me growing up, going to an HBCU, I learned, um, a little bit more but I feel like there's so much more to learn but it's like my time to learn it to actually before I even say I don't want I'm the type that I don't want to open my mouth unless I know there's facts and I could show you okay this this is what happened this is what happened I don't want to just say well I think that's what happened and they're like okay so did it happen did it not so that's why I've been a little more quiet um and trying to get more knowledge but like I said I just want to see change. I just don't want to see after the protest, everything dies down and then they're like, okay, the close is clear. We can go back to how it was. We just gave them attention right now. And then we, and then later we don't get the attention that we need. So that's all I have to say. I agree. Um, when I got, about, let me say something real quick. <laughs> I think we all feel the same way. Um, whether it is angry, sad, disappointed like I agree with Stevie um, uh, your god I think Antoinette and then at least like Dana that we all became numb at one point or we realized it and there was no hope no strategy we just felt some type of way and ever since now you see all types of races on the line you see why you see and then you see whether they want peace or whether they want just quietness and want this to all just go over. Like, it is a point in time to where we just need to find out what's today's because I, I re I'm very hopeful in the fact that this could literally change our perspective on everything. Like, we can literally be like, like, we literally, black people don't have to um, be scared when they see the cops anymore. Like we literally, like instead of, oh snap, that's, that's the police, right? We should be able to just talk. We should be able to just be like, oh, this ain't nothing. We, we, can't, we, we can't do this anymore. This is a time that we can change all of that. Like we should be able to go to the bank and be like, oh, can we get this? Can we, can we get this registered? Can we, can we blah, blah, blah? Because, the, oh, they don't have a degree. They don't have this thing. So why doesn't it make, why isn't it fair for us to do the same thing? Like it's, I agree with your god mom and Elijah. Um, we need, it, this is, you bring so much. It's Elijah, Alicia, 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 Alicia my Alicia. bad, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But yeah, it is, I'm so hopeful at this moment because like my grand, our granny used to say like, there's no reason, to, it's a reason to be sad, but it, it, they've been sad for over 400 years. And they've been on the line protesting, and people are now recognizing it. it brings even more hope that we all can just stand together. And it is, I'm very curious, like I don't have any else. I'm just very curious and very hopeful now that we can hopefully change the whole atmosphere of black lives, of white lives, any, anybody. Because although we, yes, we matter, but it's literally changing the impact on us and everybody else that's falling next. So um, I'm just super hopeful now. Like, it's just crazy. I just don't know what will happen because everything has a time and it could be going good, but the Bible said everything on left is going to be, 
it's going to be ended up in hell. Flames going to be everywhere. That's that's how you going to clear everything out. So, yeah, that's all. Um, Samba, so what you just said, I'm here for. I do disagree with the part where you're like, you shouldn't be scared of the cops. But, like, you have to understand, some people live in, like, bad neighborhoods where you're targeted. Darnell has had experiences, I think, when we were just talking, how he got pulled over and they were trying to find something because he was black. So I feel like if people live in certain areas, then they have the advantage to say that, right? I talked to my goddad who lives in Arizona. He's not as fearful or like has to be on at guard as much in Arizona as he is in LA. Cause you know, whether the cops are crazy, the people are crazy, like it's just a different environment. So I can't, I just disagree a bit much on that statement because you have to understand where you are in the world, right? If you live in LA, what? You live in stuff like that, people can be scared. That's their normal life. If you go out every time and cops are pressing me, people were pressing my stepdad last week because he was standing in front of his house. And they're like, we're looking for like some gangbanger name, whatever they say. And they're like, what? And like, no, yeah, so I, I agree. That's what I'm saying. Like, I'm saying this is the time because she, she brought out more moments that I was uh, profiled, discriminated, that I could even think of. And I just became so numb. Even going in the city where it's white supremacists, KKK, all these people, I'm putting pretty much at the same risk out there than being in the hood somewhere where I used to live in Compton, whatever, any, anywhere. Like, I'm saying this is the time to where we can just stand up and, and literally, we shouldn't be scared. We can still have hope. Yeah, we can still, like, we shouldn't be worried. We concerned, or it, maybe I'm saying it backwards. Yeah, we should be concerned, but not worried. Like, we, we should be scared. We shouldn't be scared, but, like, I don't, I don't know. I think being, I think, like, being cautious and aware is really important, but living in fear, like, from a biblical perspective, who are we to fear except the Lord, you know? And I know that I don't live in that same fear, but I genuinely believe because we were talking when we were muted but I think what he was trying to say with that is that that's what he's hoping for to change with this reform is that when you go out and you get pulled over you don't have to fear for his your life like that's that's kind of what he was going for as far as like hopeful not right now change. Could, okay. whole, I can, I'm, I'm here for that yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> like now I'm, I'm like honey I'm like um, so Shark wanted to answer. So the new question I wanted to ask is like, what do you guys think the root of the problem is? And everyone has kind of talked about like, okay, we can just sit up here and go protest all day, but like, how can we make change, right? Because even now, um, yesterday I had screenshotted it. I gotta read it some more, remember it. But it was like all these bullet points of like things that have been changed because we've been out there protesting and donating and kind of spreading awareness and different things like that. So kind of in your own, I guess, mind, what, like I said, what do you think the root of the problem is currently? And what is the change that you can advocate for now in your community or amongst your people? If so I could right take a minute, words. if so. I could take a, sorry, if I could take a minute to speak to some things that we talked about at the last point. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, Something that Dana said was that, uh, you know, I, I feel like we matter now. And I think that's a, a dangerous headspace to operate under because people of color have always mattered to our country. They've just been ridiculously exploited over the past hundreds of years. Um, and I mean, introducing uh, back to something that Chris said too. Um, was that we had our, our foot on the neck of the justice system. Uh, we've been there before. We've, we've abolished slavery, but it was just fucking reworked into our constitution again, because it immediately becomes legal to work somebody as a slave as soon as they are a convict. And that's as soon as like negative propaganda about people of color going and raping white women, going and doing heinous crimes, and just systemically being targeted by our justice system, by our police, which is massively overfunded. Um, it's, it's just a dangerous thing to, 
I'm sorry. I'm, I'm like grinding my teeth at this conversation uh, at a point holding back tears, which is weird to hear from white boy. But um, I, it bugs me. It really fucking gets under my skin. Um, but I mean, we have black and white photos of 14 year old black men who have been put to death after two hour trials and 10 minutes of deliberation. It, it's just not right. It's, I'm, we're in a point where we've been before and the system is completely slippery. It's, uh, they will just work their way into finding another way to systemically oppress people of color. And that's something that I fear we use the word unity too much. Uh, we're not communicative of the emotions that we're actually feeling because if we all feel the same, then we're all here together. But really, how many different feelings and how many different people and plans of action fall under the same word unity? I mean, it's dangerous that we blanket each other as a group with the word unity because we're not all on the same page. We all think that we have different... We all think that you know, like you, something that you said earlier, everybody has their lane. Um, that is important. It is important for everybody to have their lane. But when we're united and all driving down different lanes, it's a little tricky to keep traffic moving in the same direction. Um, so I worry about that. And I worry about, you know, us being on the brink of feeling like we're on the brink of uh, real change for uh, what would be unity as a country and it will just slither back into being another 13th amendment another you know our prisons are massly they're, they're just slave houses I mean they're privately owned and there are prisons in the south in the sorry midwest and south that you have to work an hour and a half to decide, okay, do I want to spend 10 minutes on a phone call or do I want to eat? It's, it's all bad. Definitely agree. Um, Shari, where are you at? Hey everyone, I'm on my mom's thing. So, yeah. Okay, go. So the question, do you remember the question? So what do you think is the root of the issue and how can you advocate change in your community or amongst the people you speak with? Okay, so for one, um, I really feel like the root of the problem is kind of like, it's a power thing. It's like, you know, people want power and it's how, how can I help to, or how can I start to compress somebody else's feelings and emotions towards certain things so that I can have more power or that I can kind of like, figure out, not even necessarily figure out, but how can I direct people in what areas that I want them to, I want to direct them in. Um, me personally, I've been to protest and, you know, I've donated, I, you know, signed petitions and I'm still trying to figure out where my niche is um, and how I want to start to, re ooh, to fully give back um, to the Black Lives Matter. How can I help? What can I do? Um, I've done the protesting and I enjoyed it. I mean, it was cool. But I want to I want to direct my, you know, my anger, how I'm feeling my emotions in a different way. I know that going out there and being out being there with people. Yes, it feels good to know that, that you have a, there's a, there's people behind you that you're not alone and that everything that you're feeling, others are feeling as well. Yes, that's good. But for me, I just want to I just want to know, like, what can we do afterwards? Like God mom was saying. Once we're done protesting and doing all this, what's the next step? What's the next step of action? I feel like, you know. There's a problem within the schooling, the education systems. What are we going to do to change those things to make sure that the black and brown students in school are not just learning about Columbus, who didn't even, you know, he didn't find America. How, what are we going to do moving forward to ensure that everybody is learning from their past and their history and learning about their cultures? What are we going to do? So that's just what I'm trying to, like, find my niche in that area so that I can help out and, you know, figure out what works best for me. I have a question. Uh, how much, so if we talk about what Declan just talked about and what Shari just kind of got to as far as modifying uh, classes, history classes, getting back to the roots. Talk up, Simon. Oh, 
I said as far as uh, to piggyback off of Declan and uh, Shari, as far as like modifying classes and uh, getting the education, the education that we need, I want to propose a question like how much power do we really have if the system is always going to manipulate ways to get back to the roots of things? Like, I'm just curious. Maybe somebody knows, maybe I don't know, but like how much power do we really have if obviously there's change we've been from chains to stripes and now we're free like every how much power do we really have like how long i guess nobody has to has, has to answer but how long is it going to take? yeah i was gonna say <clears throat> obviously it's systemic a systemic oppression whereas just like something you brought up earlier like a point that you made just kind of trying to make another point was like we should be able to go into a bank and just ask for a loan and it be granted to us whereas in other spaces a person of a different ethnicity with our same history will be granted that same loan you know what i mean like i feel like and the, i think the point that i was trying to make when i was saying like we matter now is that it's moments like those and i think it's because we haven't mattered that they'll grant somebody else something above us like as far as our power like i think of the black wall street and how we had jets and and banks and all of those things and conveniently it was destroyed you know what i mean where any moment where we could have built something up for ourselves because nobody else is really building us up that's also been in an effort kind of taken away from us and so i feel like yeah i see support hashtag support black but it's beyond that too i think it's a mindset a mindset shift not just for the world and for the, the white culture but for blacks too like i think the mindset needs to shift all together and like i think the and i could be wrong but i feel like the people that are going to support us is us and so the way, like, if anybody's going to build us up, it's going to have to be us ourselves. And, like, I'm almost like, let's just go on back to Africa, okay, and build up our own lives over there. We don't have to worry about none of this. We're kind of forever, you know what I mean? Yeah. But, but obviously, like, we've established ourselves in some effort here. But it always brings us back to the space of when will the blessings and the freedom and all of the promises of the constitution and the you know all of those things actually apply to us in real when life. will they be distributed because of, equally yeah because at this point all of the prisons are filled with the minorities obviously and other bad people but it's like we also have to understand that there are bigger powers that be like there's like people just trying to meet quotas and there are people that are just trying to, and sometimes they don't care if you white, black, or Asian, or whatever. They just want to get you in a sale because that generates some type of money for whatever it all works. And so at this point, I believe it's our time to hold meetings like y'all, generational wealth. And hey, guys, what about getting your credit fixed? Hey, guys, you know, just because we came from nothing doesn't mean we have to stay there. How, as a people, can we shift our mindset together? Because I feel like the oppression that we've received from everything else, oppression that we've received from everyone else has kind of convinced us that we don't matter and that we are nothing. You know what I mean? And so now we're fighting like, hey, guys, look at us. You know what I mean? But I feel like we should be looking at each other saying, hey, guys, look at us. Let's get this together. Like, you know what I mean? I think there's so many layers. Like, there are billions of layers that make it all what it is today. It's not just police brutality it's not just you know a race issue it's, it's a I, I personally feel like it's multiple layers yeah it you is know what she said um honestly it, i know you said about supporting black people but the thing about uh the black community is that we don't like to support our own like they'll like so we'll be like, I'm not supporting that. They charge it too much, but then we'll go want to go to the Gucci store and buy a belt when you could have used that same money to support your own kind. So that's, what's that's wrong what I'm saying. As as togetherness, because if we if we was able to get out that mindset, we would have a lot. We would be able to, you know, our businesses will flourish and everything. And it also in 
the the prison system it's like the government is like oh we're gonna lock up the minorities about selling marijuana but then realize how much money they was making so it was like oh we're gonna profit off of it let's make it legal but yet there are still minorities in prison for charges for selling marijuana and they won't let them out because it's gonna benefit them and make them money if they stay in there. So it's like I said, it's about voting and getting the right people in there so that it can be, so we can have a change and also working within our community to support one another. That's yes, awesome. I, I think we, it's time to realize old white men are not the answer. They're not. Um, and one thing I'd like to open like a question really quick. Um, I'm, I'm organizing a collaboration with Champion Hoodies to print my fans merch and we're donating all of the profits to right now it's penciled in as campaign zero but i don't have any other like real i've i thought about like the black visions collective because that's also lgbtq inclusive um but i i want to hear like what you what you've seen what what you know about you know different causes that we could donate to um and i also have one thing to say really quick like hitler which this was in our last century, uh, organized a genocide of people that if you looked at them, Caucasian people, and, you know, you don't look at a Jewish person and go minority. Um, but a hundred years or less than a hundred years earlier, uh, King Leopold II organized a massive genocide of the people of the Republic, it's Congo, the Republic of Congo. The, he killed 10 to 15 million people. That's just a staggering amount larger than Hitler did, and we don't cover this in schools at all. And I mean, it's like, it just begs the question, is it because they're black? I mean, I feel like police brutality isn't reported in school either. You know, that's true. Like, it's, you know, it's even though it's a huge part of the way that the, our reality is, a lot of this stuff isn't learned. Just like black culture, like somebody mentioned on the phone earlier, we don't study our history. It's low key. It starts with slavery, and like that's something that's that I'm true. super passionate about because I'm like. God, give me the funds because I want to write movies and television. I mean, because I'm obsessed with the Renaissance era, and I can watch right. anything about Queen Elizabeth. I can watch anything about King Arthur, but I can't find anything about our heritage. And it's almost like when we came to America, or we were, you know, we were brought here. That's when our lives began, and it's not the truth. And so, any space of empowerment, like any other culture, can go back. Well, I believe in america can go back and say oh this is what we were before this is what we come from so i can hold myself up from that but if i haven't learned that i don't need, i had to search so hard just to learn what our kingdom look like you know what i mean to have yeah. some type of pride in nigeria or africa or my origin and so it's like it's almost a setup like capital like it's almost a setup for us to be behind and try to figure out who we are or uh, if we're not smart enough don't define for us who we are we are the minorities that's why cnn only reports the bad of us or right. you know it's just continuism of the same cycle and i feel like that's why i said it's more than just what the world is saying about us too we also have to figure out who we are how we want to operate in this world and then fight for it at the end of the day that's funny that you say that because I was just speaking to Nas about that the other day when I was at her house and I was just like I want to learn about myself I don't know anything like it's not like I have to go on like ancestry.com or something to figure out where I'm from you know a lot of people know okay well I'm from here I'm from, like a lot of people don't know like their heritage and stuff like that so like you said it's very hard to navigate in that space because you don't know where you're from so yeah Destiny, it's Granny. Can I say something? Okay, two minutes, Max, Granny. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, um, I'm Miss Washington, and I just want to come from a spiritual aspect and just say that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers of darkness, meaning that 
I've always known who I am. And uh, I hear, hear different incidents that happened with my father and, 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 and his father of how they were treated back in the day. And my statement would always be, I am so glad that I was not born in your time because I don't know if I wouldn't have been able to deal with that. And so I, from my own personal experience, I love to go into an all white restaurant because that's when I shine the most. People have a stigma about who African Americans are, but I shine my best. I have never had a problem being amongst Caucasians or anyone. In our family, Destiny, you are you are my witness. We have different nationalities uh, in our uh, family. And uh, even one of my sons married someone of a different culture. I don't have problems with that. Love is love. You love who you love. And I've raised my children and my grandchildren to know that I don't care who you are and who you are dealing with. You are special, and there's nobody on this earth more important than you are. So you w walk with your head up. I don't walk around with fear. I do pray over my grandchildren and my children that wherever they tread their feet, that they will be safe, and I believe that God will dispatch angels that will cover them. And they do, they're all respectable, so that means they all know how to actually present themselves or know how to be respectful. And I know that even in being respectful, that they're going to encounter some situations. Well, the situations that I have dealt with, and I have dealt with a few racial situations, but I've resolved them all myself. It's the way you do things. Uh, you don't have to get unseemly and, and, and meet them where they are. I'm like Michelle Obama. When they go low, that's when we go high. And so I just want to uh, let everyone know that is on this Zoom uh, conference call that um, we're going to encounter different situations. Oh, and to Antoinette and to someone else that mentioned after the protesting, what are we going to do? What, what What's the end game? Well, I have been following the news. I have been following uh, so much of, uh, you know, Instagram and all of the positive things. If it's, if it's not positive, I'm not interested. But with this positive, uh, then what I do is I share it because not only that I know that it will help me, but it will help others. And some of the things, the protesting was because they wanted those, pro those police officers to be arrested. So they got one arrested, the one that was on the knee. And then they kept protesting because they wanted all the officers to be arrested. Well, now we're moving forward from that because now we want some reform with the police department. We want so they're, they're making laws up all around. If you follow the news, you will find out that protesting has not been in vain. And George Floyd's uh, death, it was not all about just uh Floyd, but it was about all of the other black African Americans that have been murdered and the police officers that were responsible, they were never charged. And that's what we do not want to happen. It's one thing for them to be arrested, but this is not over until they are being charged and held responsible and so I'm thankful for what is happening and what's taking place. None of this is in vain. I'm seeing what's happening. So in order to uh, know what's happening and what's going on at this point, I would advise you all to stay tuned. Be persistent in watching the news and every avenue that you can take to uh, be involved in Black Lives Matter, I would advise you to do so, whether it's protesting whether it's speaking out, and my last comment is, don't be silent. Thank you. Um, so, yeah. something she wanted to say. So, <laughs> really good. So, like, yeah. 
I'm just glad that she mentioned okay. about um, about strategy because I think that as Black people, we get so frustrated with one another because we can't seem to all land on this one um, united solution, this one. And that's just never been the story of Black people. You know, we aren't a monolith. We have lots of different ideas and approaches and solutions to these problems. This happens at the beginning of time, you know? You have your W. E. Du Bois and your Booker T. Washingtons, you have your Malcolms and your Martins, but they still find a way to advocate in their space. And I get what, is it, is it Declan? I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And I get what he's saying too, like if, you, if everybody's in all of these different lanes, then how do we create large scale impactful change? But we've been doing that before too. Um, I'm always down for discourse amongst um, the black community, trying to find ways that work for us in ways that I'm challenged too. One thing that I do think that like all black people should do is just get involved in their local politics, their local elections that's where we see the most impact i was talking to my dad the other day and he was saying like i'm going to some of these city council meetings and i don't see anybody there who looks like me and he's like it could be because you know people in our community are working two three jobs they have a lot of different factors are trying to navigate and i told my dad i said to be honest with you i know about local elections and i know about the big elections but all of the small intricacies of my community, I don't even know where to find that stuff, you know? But time and time again, we have um, chemical plants being put in our backyard, impacting black and brown people. We have all of these different things that happen in our communities that we don't have any say about and that we don't talk about. The dollars that get reallocated to the police systems or into white neighborhoods and schools should be allocated instead to black neighborhoods. But who feeds that? You know what I'm saying? Who's going to take charge in those areas? I think that's something that everybody should take on um, as a personal challenge, that in their own communities, they impact change. And then from a global standpoint, like you said, there are just too many issues to throw yourself into 100%. There's just no way that you can do it. There's the industrial prison complex. There's environmental racism. There's an the educational system. There's um, medical racism. You know, there's a reason why black women are dying in childbirth three times as much as white women do. You can't be in all spaces at all time doing 100% of the things, but we can decide which pieces mean the most to us. You know what I'm saying? I saw that um, Kim was talking about Brian and saying that Brian is saying, let's give back to our communities to mentor and teach these young people. If that is your mission, then, you, then yes, dive into that. But if you are in the medical field or you are an HR representative, then your opportunity there is to teach about racial bias when hiring or adequate pay for people of color. Like, there's just so much that we can do. But I think that sometimes we get so overwhelmed with all the different areas that we don't even know where to start. I absolutely agree wholeheartedly. Um, I was having a conversation with one of my really close friends who works in a more uh, like a nine to five job um and he's doing well in the company but he's like the only black person or one of three doing well in the company and so what he said was like god charged him like he, there are like black support groups inside of his company that he's never went to support and he was like god was like boy what are you doing? You know what I mean? And he's like, I just, he's like, going to be honest, I just didn't feel like it because I'm good. And he was, and I was like, that's honest. And there are a lot of us like that. And he was like, but I've made a commitment to make the sacrifice. And I feel like for us, the reason why, and just speaking to the black culture, the reason why we're all over the place is because there are half of us trying to keep up with the Joneses. And then there are half of us saying, well, I'm black and I'm proud. And then there are half of us saying, well, I don't really know. I'm in the middle. Then there are some people saying, I don't, I'm not going to vote because my vote doesn't matter anyway. Like, you know what I mean? And so there's so many different entities. And I feel like, like you said, I agree completely with us doing it, doing the work locally. But then also, like, our, it'd be so cool if our hugest influences would call like, hey, this is not going to be a concert tonight. This is a night where I am building our people. Mm. If Beyonce would say, meet me at the Rose Bowl, I'm paying for everybody, taking care of everything. I just want to pour into the black community 
mm-hmm. and then preach about generational wealth and talk to us about like we don't have a Martin Luther King and so what that brings us to is every person has to be Martin Luther King like you you have to be the Martin Luther King in your household teach yes. your children generational wealth teach your children how to you know what I mean like we have to become our own activists for our home first it, it's not enough to go protest we have to shift our mindset so I, I completely agree and I want to be very delicate too about sometimes the trope that you know I hear all the time you know black people will stand in line to get some Jordans but won't stand in line to vote that's very dangerous to me And that's not the truth of what I'm seeing in my communities either. If you look at Georgia with their elections the other day, the type of voter suppression that was happening out there, you had black people lined up blocks and blocks and blocks for hours and hours and hours. They had been calling in to their their city officials saying, our machines don't work, or this isn't working for us, or we don't have enough space to take care of this neighborhood, and nobody showed up for them. But black people are out there, rain, snow, coronavirus, to vote. We do show up in some of these spaces, you know, and I think that sometimes we hear so much about what we're not doing as a community that, yes, we have to hold each other accountable for sure. But when we do show up, advocate for that as well. There are people out here who are trying and unfortunately, they're still getting their voices stifled. Yeah, like we'll do it and that's why it kind of brings me back to the question that Stevan asked how much power do we really have how much influence can we really have when the powers that be can fix or rig a system or have people where voting was supposed to close at 6 p.m but they're still in line at midnight like then how do we now i think the question is how do we surpass that how can we work around that where we don't have to go through the system to get the results that we need what is it that we can do in our minds like what is it that can we can we like think of or create that will help us start generating wealth in our own culture you know what i mean and obviously that brings me back to the black wall street but then build something enough to protect it like what is what does that even look like for us now because obviously going the traditional route has been ineffective to a certain extent for us so then what does it look like now that we know these roadblocks that have kind of been set up for us how how do we work our way around that now if that makes sense can i interject into the conversation real quick destiny were you about to talk Okay, so I agree completely with Dana and Stevie, what you were saying about participating in the local, the local channels. Now, my thing is, yes, it's important for us to vote, um, but just like the situation you mentioned in Georgia, um, we have to be intentional about holding these people we put into office accountable for us because they're elected to serve us and represent us in different spaces. So if they're in office and only advocating for their own ideals, or being pressured by others in their space to push certain agendas, it's really important for us to hold them accountable. And so it's like, how do you hold them accountable? I mean, there are at least, I I don't know, I think a lot of us are here in LA or in California, some are out of state, but there's neighborhood councils, there's city council meetings where they have public comment. It's really important, you can, there's Twitter, (laughs) you can reach out to the people who are in their circles or in their office or in their cabinets, however you phrase it. Um, It's really important for us to reach out and make sure our voices are heard in that way. Um, And you can do that. Like someone said earlier, I've been listening. It's like there are different lanes for everyone and everyone has the ability to contribute, whether it's empowering your own community. Um, But I think it's important to vote, hold the people accountable, and then tap into whatever communities or spaces you're a part of to empower those people there. So great conversation and discussion so far. I think going off that too, I am a big believer that like God has you right where he wants you. Um, And if you guys, Ron, if you remember what he was talking about earlier, that area, the community of 6,000 people in Midwest Iowa, I grew up in Long Beach, California. It's still where I live. And I um, said just graduated from there, but I also go to Northwestern in Iowa. And something for me was like, I got there I know I'm white, but I felt so out of place. It was one of the largest culture shocks I had ever experienced. And I almost left because it, it just freaked me out. Like it kind of just scared me and I was not very open to change or any of that. But then um, I was kind of given the worship leader position 
at my college and took that on and began to be able to minister and disciple so many different people who have so many different perspectives and opinions and spiritual gifts and just different talents and something that God had put on my heart um, that would kind of reach the people who don't necessarily know how to jump in and do their part right now in that community. I think Ron, this was probably early May, late April that I had emailed Ron and said, hey, we need, well, I say need, but <laughs> what I would like, God has put this on my heart to start like a, like a privileged deconstruction life group at Northwestern. I think that is something that you know, before this even happened was important. And now this is, this is highlighted. Everybody's emotions are heightened. Action is being taken um, at a faster pace right now. Things are changing a ton, which is beautiful. And I think just starting where you are placed, where you're at, and yeah, being able to touch those that are directly around you is super important. So for me, that's what I can do, you know, like I'm, I'm reading books and resources, trying to get all the information that I can, knowing that I'm going to have to partner with other people who have different experiences and are different backgrounds and cultures. But um, for me, that was something that God had, had put on my heart in quite perfect timing, I think. But yeah, as far as, as knowing where you are and what you can do in your own person and area, that's definitely something that I think is is important is just gathering in those groups and being able to be vulnerable, being able to really open up and look at, you know, the the yucky stuff that's on the inside that you don't even know you have. Okay, mother-in-law, your time to shine. <laughs> I got to I don't want to no, change. No, no, no. My mom's been waiting for like so long. Yeah, She's hold on, nice. hold on. So then you can go out to her. I know it's like everybody pretty much touched on what I was going to say thus far but it's been good um I pretty much want to say that's what it boils down to I feel like at this moment we have the nation involved and I think that's what separates it from you know in in past tense of what took place um so many people that have not been educated on what's been going on in our communities and with racism and so on are now involved and I feel like this is the time to keep pushing rather than just allow it to be a couple days push it under the rug and then that's it so I definitely agree with everybody that's saying we need to get involved locally um, find some groups that you can become a part of um, I know Alicia was talking earlier and she spoke on um, like not really wanting to say too much until she's educated herself and sometimes that's all I am I'm like okay I feel a type of way but I would like to have more knowledge of what's going on before I really go in you know and so now I feel like we should definitely do that we should be educating ourselves on what's going on we should be getting involved um obviously I mean even when it came down to the rights and stuff I know me and um Anthony had discussed this when I was down at her house and even Martin Luther King spoke of um a riot is the language of the unheard and I feel like we had just protested probably like either the beginning of the year or the end of last year and we were peacefully protesting you know and that's what we've been doing and it hasn't been enough and so with our anger and emotions we just like had to latch out and like totally get everyone's attention to let them know like we are no longer going to um allow you guys to get away with this like we're putting our foot down if we have to tear something up to get your attention we're gonna tear it up and so, um, and I feel like it spoke volumes, you know, I mean, people, things were torn up. Some black people, things were, you know, um, damaged, but at the end of the day, we we're trying to get a message across. And I believe that we 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 have some ears that are open, wanting to listen to what we have to say. So I just say for everybody, um, definitely support black. Uh, we all have to do better. Even if we are among some of our people, because I know I get irritated with some of our, peop our people as well. And it's like, look, get it together. Like, child, why you got to be doing the extra stuff? You know, sometimes we may have to pull someone to the side and say, you know, it's a better way of handling it. We may have to get more involved on the front end. You know what I mean? Instead of talking about them later on, like, girl, that was a hot mess. You know, we just have to do better as a people, hold people responsible and, um, you know, love on each other a little bit more, you know, and I think that's really what it boils down to. We have to ha try and have a pure heart. Sometimes it's difficult, 
but um, we, we just have to try to find empathy for other people's situation. Um, again, just love more. And then um, maybe, you know, if everybody take responsibility um, and do their part, we can all, you know, it, it'll be a better nation. I want to, I wanted to share something with Declan said, he said the system was like slippery and that's, that's true. I, I, I helped that because I wanted to speak on it, but everybody else was like sharing but like it is slippery because I got in I got in trouble with the police like early on, uh, mm -hmm. like when I was like nine, ten, ten years old, and I was held um, in, on probation from ten years old to 12, 12 grade. So from ten years oh, old yeah. to twelve grade. So um, and then and then I got a brother that's doing a hundred years, and then I got a homie that's doing a hundred years, and they ain't killed nobody. You know what I'm saying? But then you look and then you see these polices and they kill somebody and then they don't get charged so yeah, i just want to speak on the slippery part that word right there that's 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 facts because it's slippery they'll forget about you my probation officer uh i used to have to check in every lunch like um and she looked at me she was like why are you still on probation she didn't even understand why i was on probation because i was trying to walk the straight and narrow which is hard because when you get pulled over that you have to let them know oh i'm, I'm on probation or if you don't that's another that's another charge that's another that's and then and then you get put deeper and deeper under the under the uh the jail you know what i'm saying so yeah under the that, boot that that's, slippery with facts that's wrong that's it's just wrong that's nuts to me 10 years old to graduation yep facts did they even have like a reason for why or just Nah, it just they it, it was like i was i kept going i kept going to court and everything like that but it was kind of like, okay, well, you got another hearing. Then you got another hearing. And I'm like, okay, when is the hearings going to stop? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then I had a judge saying, oh, well, you didn't show up to one hearing. I think I forgot to wake up early in the morning. And um, I had a bench warrant. They was like, oh, well, they called my mom. I'm like, well, yeah, uh, bring your son down. He's going to jail. And, like, I had people in my corner that fought for me that knew some judges that called. And I got her that. But it's just – it's slippery. Just like how you said. Yeah. That I mean, take it back to the 80s and you've got white dudes – walking off of cocaine like oh you had some coke and it's crack crack is it, it is uh marketed to the black community it's it purposefully placed in a certain community and then the, the charges are just heightened on it it's just yeah. it's it is slippery and that's very scary what is a 10 year old doing on parole or probation in the first place what's a 10 year old doing on probation or parole in the first place that's facts. That's what I'm talking about. And it's like sometimes yeah. people are so desensitized to this stuff and it's like, dang, man, you're on parole for eight years. Why were you on parole probation in the first place? You're a boy. And so many times black kids are like treated like full on grown adults. We hypersexualize young girls and we make these little boys into grown men. That is a problem in itself. I just like we take the scraps so much and we're just like, damn, we gotta fix the probation system. A child should not be on probation in the first place. That makes no sense. None. That's like the it's Emmett true. Temple situation. He was 14, you know, and he literally had the worst, he was in trial two hours and then he got executed. Like you're 14 mm -hmm. and this lady's lying saying you did this. And it's like, you're going to kill this little kid? Like, so yeah, the system is trash. Marketing. Marketing is one of the most powerful tools known to mankind. And one of the, this is a super controversial way of saying this. It's going to sound awful at first, but the way that um, I jokingly put it is, oh, the problem with minorities is that they're a minority. That's, that's the problem. Because when you're marketed to a mass group of white people that hold a more influential base than other people, you, you are now making decisions for another group of people instead of giving the power to people that are directly affected by the, change, uh, by the changes to law and the decisions that are being made. It's, the power is just stripped from you to decide your own future. And it's, excuse my language, bullshit. It's, it's bullshit. Yeah, I mean, if you're like me, I, I'm a movie person. I like, I'm like, I'm a visual person. So there are a lot of movies, like just, um, for example, Just Mercy, I don't know, it's free this month, if you haven't seen it. That shows prime example that if you fit the description, 
they're going to automatically see you as guilty or they just need that person no matter where you are, even if you have a alibi. That's how it's always been. And it's still like that. Like, okay. Um, I think it's Khalif, um, Khalif Browse, Browder from New York. Prime example, the same, the same with him. He was locked up and they had to fight for him to get out of jail. But it, what the system does and being in prison on a young child, it messes with their mind. He wasn't able to, to be out in the world even after he got Keep out. Keep it straight, yeah. yeah. And also, um, there's one on Netflix called Miss Virginia. That's another one with the uh, um, council, how she was trying to fight for more money in the inner community schools, how they were only giving it out to the suburb, suburban schools, but inner black cities weren't getting enough funds. So she, what she had to do to fight to get that so her son could get a good education. So there's a yeah. lot of people that you're not really in, like focused, like reading books, stuff like that. If you want more knowledge, there are movies out there that you can watch. That's yeah. It's, 13th is a good one. Um, and it, it talks about how the 13th amendment just, rewrote slavery and it's a great i don't think it's a, a bible or anything but it definitely touches base on a lot of points that you need to go down the rabbit hole and educate yourself on um, something you said you literally took it right out of my mouth how marketing is one of the biggest tools because i mean i thought of something and it's like lighter for us but this movie called the fighting temptations but one of the biggest things it was kind of like showing us exactly what's happening corporately in our reality what we don't even know where it was as simple as marketing 40 ounce drinks in like a minority area where and where you'll probably drive the calabasas and you won't see a sign like that at all you know what i mean but it's like all we see is what will become like we're creatures of habit and if all that we see is you know gold chains and cars with rims and spinning whim rims it's like you know what i mean we're literally gonna be a product of our environment and so like mark that's why i kept putting so much emphasis on the mindset shifting because it has to go like into the way that we see even things that we're that are actually being given to us purposely to keep our mindsets the same way. That's kind of like what I was saying. Hey, I got a question. We're about to get out of here because we got to go somewhere. But uh, two kind of back on the supporting black uh, black people. <laughs> um, I'm curious for others, uh, but for myself, how to specifically, if there's any advice, how to specifically go about that because if I do an honest, just speaking for myself, like, um, I have no problem. I love supporting us. Uh, of course, there's loopholes. We, we we do certain things a different way or whatever, but I have no problem doing that. And I have no problem in going, buying other people's. Uh, but how to go about that versus if I keep it, you know, like, just getting a great product and a product that's not, develop obviously we don't have the money to have that great product or this the medical to equipment to have like just the necessary tools we need how to even go about that of course we need to get the funding to raise that but how to do that so that's my sec my first question and then second um what is our mindset like as far as trusting the police or like how are we going to go about building that relationship or how are we going to go about talk? Like, what did you guys' mindset on that? Cause at some point, Rayford. huh? Rayford. Oh, Rayford. Yeah. Ron probably can talk a little bit about that. My mindset was I was 11 and then I skipped 12 and I turned 13. <laughs> I ain't yeah, no right. that's on the serious note though. Yeah. yeah, yeah. On, on the serious, like that's, that, that's so true, bro. Like, but at some point, we can't keep holding that mindset. We're gonna be stuck, and yeah, we gotta be the bigger person, right? Like, are we gonna just be fighting flames and dying? And everybody, like, everybody gonna just go out? We just gonna all go out with a bra? Like something. I ain't gonna lie. Recently, I got pulled over for speeding, and it was sad that what went through my mind is because it was like nighttime. I yeah. said, "Oh my god, I hope they don't kill me." Yeah, right. It's, it's, and I'm a worship really. pastor, pre like you know what I mean. I'm a work like so quote unquote far removed 
But because I know the color of my skin, I said, God, just I hope this goes well and it doesn't get violent and I don't end up dead. Lit, I promise you those were my thoughts. And so I, and it hasn't shifted yet. So that's kind of where right. I did. With so I think our, our, in the midst of all this, we still have to be careful. Like that mindset, in order to, to be better and see better, we may, we may, sadly to say, we may not make it to, to, uh, to see that change, see that happen. But for us to live, especially if we live under God without fear, we can't have our mindset like that continuously. It has to be some growth to it. And that's for them too. If they, the police was living, if the sheriff or whatever, the commander, they would have to do their job too. It can't just rely on us as we've been saying for years. But as far as us getting to them, no matter what they've done to us, we still got to have a different mindset and develop that mindset to forget and be like, hey, look. I think there's a forgiveness element, but there's a self-preservation element too. I think that we were putting way too much on the police to do in our communities in the first place. Communi police officers aren't supposed to de-escalate mental health issues right. or people with drug abuse issues. That's not the job of the police. They're supposed to be there to protect and serve, but instead they are just harassing low income black and brown neighborhoods. That's not good for anybody. And that does add another level of stress and tension on the police force. I saw that um, story in Florida. There's an autistic guy who's having an episode in the middle of the street and his autism therapist is there trying to deescalate and he gets shot four times. There's just a level of, there's a lack of training, there's a lack of, a lack of um, competence that I'm seeing in the police force as well. And you know, only really Destiny and Darnell know this, but I'm not down for the respectability politics of, you know, he was a bird watcher and he was still, you know, racism against, oh, this person was a professor and a PhD. I have had police officers pull guns in my face. I have been handcuffed, put on the floor. It was degrading, a humili humiliating experience, put in the back of a police car, all because we looked like somebody. So I shouldn't have to put myself in harm's way just to make sure that I can have dialogue with police officers. I think police officers should be required to have a certain amount of time in the communities in which they're supposed to serve. I think that a lot of white people need to talk to other white people who talk to other white people about what's going on around them and through their areas. Because the truth of the matter is, and it's an elephant in the room, the, the police department is steeped in racism. In the South, the police department was there to catch slaves. And now you have people who are saying they're fourth and fifth generation police officers. And all I'm hearing is that the ideology of the good old boy South has been passed down four or five times. I, the oppressed, should not have to be the one sitting in these rooms telling them, please don't kill me. I think that this is the time, if any, to have people who are in privilege talk to other people of privilege right. to re reinstate change. I'm not saying we don't have any part in this, but I think that we have spent too much time just trying to be seen as human when the system of the pol police department in itself is just really corrupt. There are some quote unquote good and bad apples, but for every person I'm seeing kill a black person, there are four other officers who just watch in silence and don't say anything at all. They're just as guilty to me as anybody else, you know? And at the same time, the LAPD has the DA in their pocket. They're paying off all these mayors and politicians in itself. And they're saying, if you give us any punishment, you won't be reelected. So we do have some larger systemic issues, but I personally don't think it's gonna help with me going into the police department and saying, hey, listen to me, I'm a human being. I think we need to talk about this a little bit more large scale. Um, because it could be Darnell, it could be me, it could be you. You can be walking, you can be on the phone walking your dog, you could be helping an autistic boy, and somehow we still end up shot. I just don't know at what point respectability is going to get us the decency of human life, you know. Well, I'm, just, uh, I'm confused. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I just wanted to say, because uh, we had an officer come speak to us, maybe Ron, you can speak more a little bit uh, if I miss something, but one yeah right, uh, this dude he's a he's a sheriff or a cop police he's in Compton California in Compton, yeah. and came and talked to us at school but there's out of their training process 16 or 32 weeks of training 
they only get two hours of community, communi communi like, uh, like community, relationships, yeah. social, two hours out of, there's 24 hours in a day, 36 weeks, two hours <laughs> to learn. It should already be common sense to talk to people, to wow. know, figure out what's going on, but they only get two hours out of that 32 weeks. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, no, that's definitely crazy. You had told me that a few weeks ago, and I was telling Darnell, like, what? Like, now it, it makes sense why they act the way they act, or they think Black people are some animals, because they don't have enough experience to be in these communities and know, like, no, these are just regular people. Maybe they're just, like, they have high energy, but no, like, it just makes sense. Like, they don't have enough training in the communities to even navigate or know kind of the way we operate. But another question, I know you guys are about to leave, but I want to ask Sarah and everyone else who like isn't black before you guys get out. What are your conversations like with your families or your non-black friends now that like this is all going on? Yeah, they're, mm, for the most part, I have had really fruitful conversations. Um, I am uh, a very opinionated person and outspoken and right now I really do think that it's time for white people to shut up and to learn how to be allies and learn how to um, be able to amplify voices that matter right now you know and kind of like what Stevie was saying like yeah if you can't walk in there that's up that's up to people who do who have that privilege who can get that attention without being looked on differently you know um, so for me, my household, like my family overall extended, black, white, Asian, all of that political, like my mom and dad are on different sides of the spectrum, you know, like very diverse. So for me, my political beliefs are not my parents, you know, some of my religious beliefs are not those of my parents, you know, it's not something that I was just given and passed on I really had to learn that for myself and, and something that my friends and I have been talking about um, kind of leans really closely with that that just because you were taught to be one way doesn't mean like just because it is the way it is does not mean that's the way it should be and that's the way it could be mm -hmm. um, so for me those conversations look like all right what are you doing now what are you observing now what position are you are you taking leadership are you are you taking the back road right now are you being more of a follower like what does it look like for you to educate yourself and educate those around you in a way that you don't feel like you're sacrificing all of these friendships? You know, what do respectful and understanding conversations look like? What do loving understanding conversations look like? I have this kid who was on a worship team <laughs> at, um, was on my worship team at, at my college and he had just been commenting really snarky things on some of the posts I've been putting up. And I've kind of been taking the side of a, okay, I, I wanna hear you out. You know, I wanna understand your side, hopefully, as an invite for him to want to hear mine, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but those, com those, those comments, it's like, first of all, as someone who identifies as a Christ follower, is supposed to be living like Jesus and loving like Jesus, you can't pick and choose the ways you want to do that or who you want to love or who you want to act like Jesus towards. You know, you don't get to choose that. You're all in or you're falling short in ways that are so needed in the kingdom, you know? Um, so for me, those conversations have looked very fruitful so far, but also, um, yeah, I've had a lot of people unfollow me saying that it's not my job to speak about it, but I mean, they can sit down, <laughs> you know, like, they, never have it. they <laughs> and the thing with me is like, I, I am a very emotionally driven person. And if, if you're gonna, if you're gonna, so little, go. little. Yeah, but here's the thing. Stead and I, we had a little part card conversation at school, I think my sophomore year, so a year and a half ago. And a cop came up, because it's a really small town, and there's no one out past like 8 p.m. So a cop came up and shined his flashlight in the car. Hey, what are, you, what are you guys up to? Points the light at me and says, are you here under your own free will? And I thought to myself, like, words that I cannot say right now. <laughs> I was going to go to jail. I was, it was like, that's it. It's just, that's it. it's just beyond my understanding and comprehension how assumptions and prejudices and all those things can come about in the most simple, simple of situations, you know? It blows my mind and it pisses 
pisses me off. And personally, like I said earlier, righteous anger, I am, I am rooted in that right now. That is what is driving me because heaven coming to earth, that's what, that's what we're doing. That is our job as Christ followers. And if we're not willing to really embrace the kingdom and embrace each other, how is that going to happen? So for me, those, those conversations have looked very challenging, but also, yeah, very fruitful. That's good. That's good. And we appreciate you, like, you know, going against the grain and, like, you know, being that voice because people may be your friend and they see someone speaking out like, oh, like, I didn't know. Now you're educating it. So now, you know, so you're not just going like, well, either you were taught this or you didn't know. Now you're like, okay, let me educate myself. Let me do my part and let me help and move it forward. Right, right. And I, I, I really do believe that education is like the first step in this. And um, for me, it's from seeing different things with family members that are black, with Stead and his family, and just um, friends and different people in the community and on the news and just reading books and, and listening to podcasts, which is never something I really did before, but they're so, uh, so informative. Um, but just being able to do those things because I love leadership. That is something that I am very, um, I think, gifted in spiritually and just interested in. And for me, being a leader means being a follower first. So yes, right now is my time to listen. It's my time to learn. And I'm encouraging all of my friends that um, are not black or are not minorities to do the same. So Nas, you, and then Julian. I mean, Declan, sorry. Declan. He said, dude. Hi guys, thank you. Yeah, hi, thank you guys. That's um, so with my friends, I'm very fortunate and lucky that my friends all pretty much think the same way that I do. And so these conversations really for us have just been kind of checking our own privilege and really making ourselves aware of like the things that we never even thought about. Um, I mean, obviously, like there's so many overtly racist things that we have seen and we've thought about and we've talked about but just checking just even the things that never even occurred to us so like for me i think it was the saturday night of the protests and there were helicopters going from like 3 p.m and it was like 8 p.m and i was just like sitting at home and i was like damn this sucks like i've been hearing helicopters since like three and then i was like holy shit Nas! like this is black people's norm like your fear of just being in your apartment that's a black person's norm, which like, it really, really, really upsets me and makes me very emotional because I grew up with family members that were always like, everyone's the same, nobody is better than the other. And like, you treat everyone equally and fairly. And so for me, like, I've always made it a point to try to see like how people are treated differently, just because it bothers me so much on like such a major level. Like, between learning about the Holocaust and learning about the racism in this country. Um, so like, yes, with my friends, it's been conversations of what do we get that black people don't get, that African Americans don't get. And so let's check that because these are examples that we can give to other people that I've unfortunately come into contact with people that are like denialists of racism. Um, generally white privileged males. <laughs> I've gone into actual arguments while on dates because they've been like, racism's not a thing anymore. And I'm like, how dare you say something so insane? Like I one time had to get up and leave because I was so angry at this privileged white man saying like, no, like I have black friends and they're treated the same. And I was just like, I can't even believe that you think growing up in Brentwood, your black friend has had the same experience as you. Cause I, promise you it's not the same at all and so like just having those conversations but like also learning how to have them in a better way to try to like show people like just because you're not necessarily seeing it doesn't mean that the opportunities that are afforded to you are happening to other people like you have to realize that you get those opportunities because you're white or because of the color of your skin and if you were any other color, you wouldn't get it. Um, and like, I went home and I was with my parents last week and my parents are immigrants, I'm first generation. And again, my parents are of the mentality that everyone should be treated fairly and equally. And 
it, it was hard being there for four days because every time like something came up, I was like, that's racism, mom and dad. Did you know that? Did you pick up on that? And they're just like, no, what are you talking about? And I'm just like, I understand that like the, from the bottom of your hearts, you don't want to believe that it's true, but like it is something that is out there and it is something that you guys have to acknowledge. So it's just an ongoing dialogue that has to just happen all the time and destiny like i told you like i'm with you guys and i will have those conversations because it's it's not on you guys like you guys have been going through this for so long and it's just like unfair to ask that you have to sit there and explain to us why you guys should be afforded the same opportunities and that you're not and i'm in this fight with you and i will keep having those conversations and i will be bringing them up more and more because I don't think that we should shy away from them anymore. Love you. <laughs> and Declan. Hi. So, um, kindergarten through eighth grade, I was lucky enough to be thrown into schools that were public and near me, I live in Lakewood. Um, uh, running into middle school, I was maybe one of anywhere between five to 15 uh white kids out of our 30 person classes so it it was nice to start from a base of okay people are people uh i skipped my last day of my public middle school and pretty much lost contact with all the friends that i'd made except for my neighbors uh victor and josh um and victor is the rhythm guitarist in my uh current band under the name under my name um and I was put into a private Christian school where uh, you had diverse groups, but of course, going from a student body of 3,500 people to around 600, there's, there, it's a lot different, that's for sure. Um, so it was interesting to see uh, people grouped and I didn't really have like a, a group of friends that the school had a $45,000 grand piano in its old cafeteria. So I'd just kind of isolate myself and play piano. And um, when I would just walk around at lunch or breaks, I, I would see groups of, you know, like, okay, these are all white kids. These are all white kids. These are all white kids. Another table of all white kids. And then you know, a couple of oh, diversified friend groups. And then I, I see, you know, people who are almost, separating themselves from everybody else. And uh, we had a group at our school that had a slogan that was fucking awful. And it was, if you ain't Dutch, you ain't much. So, hearing fucking white supremacy from a group at my school that I had been transferred into after losing touch with my people, you know, um, it, it was weird to join a, a group that I could see had a different way of thinking. Um, and, you know, I've been comfortable around people my whole life. I, I've been playing shady crappy bars and casinos since I was 10 years old um, around musicians of all color I I okay I joined this band um, called FTC and I would play Filipino bar after Filipino bar and oh my god the food oh I it's just I think it's such a shame when you see white people and I have you know friends which I will say this, and you may think this is controversial. I think if you have a friend who you label as racist, if they are taking immediate action and being intentionally racist, that's not somebody you want to be affiliated with. Absolutely. But I do think that there are people who have, you know, kind of been just washed by systemic racism and don't see what they're doing is wrong. And as privileged white people, I think it's our place to kind of step in and not kind of, to step in and correct that behavior because you just don't want to be around it. 
and so why would anybody else you know if, if my skin is white and i don't want to be around it why the fuck would you if you're black that's it's not even a question it's just like it's our responsibility to hold each other accountable to treat other humans as humans as who we are and you know i think every conversation is different because every person is different i think it's that's a it's a hard question my conversations have looked like hey you can't say that here and you can't say that at all you can't i mean i have a 60 year old dad a white 60 year old dad who went to high school with some racist motherfuckers who was raised by one racist abusive motherfucker where it's like you can't do that and and every day i mean he listens to music like neil young who gigantic protest songs and i um i don't know if you have heard of the group the emotions they sang with like earth, earth wind and fire i'll play old music that's you know like they're black artists and they'll make a joke and i'm just like fucking disgusted and i and i make sure he knows that's it, just not something you want to be affiliated with and i i really should have a a more prepared answer to this question but i'm glad i'm being put on the spot because it's getting the wheels turning and i think it's i've always thought it's very important that we hold each other accountable to treat humans as humans and that's you know one thing that is dangerous when we've been taught to look at other races as subhuman uh, through a system that's it's awful yeah it is good to start the conversation and um you know, I heard something that uh, I kind of not cringe. I don't know what that is, but jumped at where I heard somebody say that um, that Asian people didn't have like the same struggles that they did. Which, yeah, but at the same time, a lot of my Asian friends, you're not you're not immediately criminalized because you're Asian. That's that's one thing that I will put out there. You're not like that's not a. Uh, knee-jerk reaction but i just think people of color of any color have a harder road than privileged white people in our country and it's our job to reach out a hand and try to help so that's what i have to say agreed and appreciate it and i could see like it's a lot on you as well i know it's confusing stevie we were talking about like mental health awareness and this will be like the last thing um was that yeah okay so i have a website that is for like wellness so i know a lot of us whether we're black or we actually just care about the cause we may need like an outlet or something like that so if you guys need this website i can send it to you and what is it exactly stevie it's called Dive In Well. It's like a wellness, um, a wellness website. So they have different resources for you to talk to people, whether it be therapy or different ways to really care about your health. And they also have like curated dinners. I don't know how they work now with quarantine and stuff like that, but they're curated dinners for people to come and talk about like wellness, what they're going through or how they're impacting changing their community and different things like that. And me and Destiny had kind of talked about it because just talking to our friends and family, people were saying how stressed they were, how um, tight they were feeling in their neck and their shoulders, um, how people weren't being able to sleep, migraines, things like that. And we know too, the black community that um, disproportionately we are impacted by our health and systemic racism impacts that too. You know, hypertension, um, heart disease, all of these things that pile up due to stress and microaggressions and racism couldn't help that. So it's a really good resource just in case. Um, and then I can send Destiny some more too, just in case she wants to share those. That's, that's funny, that's actually, I'm sorry. I have, I have a question, is that cool? Sorry, what was it? Yeah, yeah, I have a question really quick. Um, I am trying to organize, organize um, the selling of clothes. So it's, it's kind of like, okay, I don't, well, for a couple of friends and I are getting together, we don't like have lumps of cash to donate, but we're kind of like trying to organize something where it's like, hey, you can help us give back. So we'd just be donating everything that we make 
two different causes. So far, the only thing that I've really like settled on is campaign zero because it's the eight can't wait. You know, we have to ban headlocks. We can't let people shoot their guns without any fucking warning because people will call back up um, without even having seen other people's licenses or registration, uh, having already had them out of the car. And I've seen people get thrown with no context. So, I mean, I'm sorry, this is something that bugs me and I want to know if you guys have any causes that you really support so I can um, do my research. I have some, I have to like get them off my phone. Do you have like an Instagram and I can maybe DM you? Yes, some? Um, I'm, it's my last name, except instead of an apostrophe, it's a period. So O dot R A I D Y. Sounds it. Okay, yeah. So I could send over like the resources that I have or know. Okay. Thank you. Maybe that can help. Um, so yeah, then there was just us. So I just want to thank everyone for coming. This went actually better than I expected. Thank you guys for, oh, look at Elizabeth. Elizabeth, I didn't hear your voice this whole conversation, so let's say hi. Hey, y'all. Uh, can y'all hear me? Yeah, Mar look, I really Mar wanted to speak. Look, I really wanted to speak before. So you gotta speak louder. Hello, can you hear me? Can you yeah. Hear me? Okay, I really wanted to speak before, but the conversation just kept on going out of hand, and I was like, where do I interject? And a lot of people said what I was gonna say, so I was like, okay, let me just you know, because Stevie, she done took it all. I was like, Lord, I had my paper ready. I was looking at it. I said, no, she done named everything on my list. What am I going to say now? Like, <laughs> you took it with the, um, the mass incarceration, the miseducation, misjustification, mm. access to wealth, police genocide, health, like everything that I had and what I was going to say, she done took it. And other people, when they were talking, I was like, okay, let me just sit here and just be quiet, you know, Love and just it. listen. Love you, Liz. Okay. <laughs> but let me let me mute myself. But thank you, Destiny, because I'm like this really is needed, you know, in our community and in just other communities as well. Just finding that I guess bridge, you know, because a lot of times we don't really know what's going on or what is the next step, which is something that is really needed, you know, just to understand what is the next step in hand. Um, we don't have a lot of conversations, and I'm glad that was brought up that, hey, is it policy? Is it reform? Is it, like, what are, is it a law? Like, what are we going to do? We can't just keep on protesting. But thank you. Yay. Of course, thank you guys for supporting and, like, tuning in and trying to be a part of the conversation. It means there'll be emotion now, so it means a lot, you know? You might not see it, but in the inside, I'm weeping with joy and tears. So, again, I thank you guys for being a part of this conversation, part of this cause, and let's continue to, like, make change. I hope, like, if we didn't, like, I hope everyone learned something in this. I hope, like, we're going to build some community somehow and, like, figure out more ways that we can, like, take action. Like, someone has said, going to these meetings, now I'm like, okay, let me figure out where the meetings are. Let me find them online, you know, and then that way educate everyone else and stuff like that. So like I said, thank you guys for doing your part, being a part of the conversation and trying to create change. I love y'all and I thank y'all so much. Do this again sometime, will you? We gonna, you're going to do yours next. <laughs> and I want you to hold us accountable, you know? I want you to ask us, what do we intend to do in our communities? What do we intend to do to activate change? And then, you know, bring us to the mat next time. Stevie, yeah. what have you done? Uh, I want to be, I want to have a whole list of things that I've done to really, you know, move this conversation. So Exactly. And I'll post on my story. I was saying earlier how someone was like, kind of, okay, we're protesting and all this stuff, but like, the stuff changing, da da da. And I'll post what I've seen someone say, like, all these different things have, like, changed because of the protesting. And because of the awareness. So I'll post that and then you guys can repost or just look at it, whatever, to have it for your own self. Um, so we can just see the change. I know it feels like it's very like far fetched, but like I was telling you guys, we were slaves at one point. Like anything is possible. Obama was the president. Like there was, we were colored and neat, um, niggers and like 
you can use this because you mm -hmm. have to go to the Negro uh, fountain or you can go to this classroom. So like change has happened. So I think this is the best time now. It's like my mom said, it's like the world is like watching it. It like things are changing. Like defund the police. Mm -hmm. Anyway, thank y'all. And I will talk to you guys soon. Bye.